Welcome to the Standing in This Place podcast. I'm Rachel Carter and I'm the artist behind this project, supported by National Lottery Project Grants through Arts Council England. I'm going to be telling the historic tale of the intertwining of the lives of women working in the textile mills of the industrial Midlands and the enslaved women working the cotton fields in America. I'd like to welcome my special guest, Nadia, to the podcast, and she's going to be the first one of my community voices. Uh, So a chance to uh, sit over coffee, have a chat and discover lots of different things about Nadia. So thank you, Nadia, for being the first community voice on the podcast. You're welcome. Thank you for inviting me. So uh, we met um, through another gentleman through the through the project standing in this place and um, we started having a chat and you've got quite a few um, connections to the textile industry yourself through your um, ancestry but um, let's start by just having a bit of an introduction of um, who is Nadia and I knew you grew up in an area of Notting called Newark uh, but let's um, if you don't mind just give us a little uh, background into into you. Um, well, I was actually born in a small village called East Stoke, which is three miles out of Newark. Originally, I was there until I was three years old. My grandfather was a gamekeeper for an estate there, and he first introduced me to drawing by teaching me how to draw animals and birds. Right. And you told me about your grandmother as well, that uh, she was a, a housekeeper. Is that correct? Yes, that's right. She was the housekeeper for Sir John Jardine, who actually was um, a significant person. In fact, his father before him and his grandfather in the lace building machines of Nottingham. And she worked for him as a housekeeper uh, for quite a number of years. And it was while she was working with him that my mum fell pregnant. And um, his niece, who was um, Lady Kinnaird at the time, uh, she asked if I could be named after her. So that's why I became Nadia. Amazing. Didn't, I didn't know that. So, uh, so you was named after the lady of the house. Do I remember rightly that your mum also um, started working for this, this same uh, eminent gentleman? That's right. Yes, she did. She used to go and help, particularly when... Um, Lady Kinnaird was there, who was the niece of Sir John Jardine, and they became quite close friends, and she used to do all of her dress alterations and anything which she could help her with. That, that's amazing, you know, to get those those stories. I, I know I found um, a, a few women in my own family tree that um, mm-hmm. but the only information I've got is that they were in service and the place that they were where they were working but I don't have much more information about the day-to-day life and who they worked with um, so it's fascinating to hear that you've got those that you have those stories passed down from grandmother to mother to daughter that's right yes so that's really interesting that you've got those that oral history from your uh, mother and, and grandmother and uh, you mentioned your grandfather introduced you to uh, into drawing uh, as you know as part of his role looking after the land and drawing the the wildlife that you saw so did that continue into uh, you know into your school life uh, yes it did I mean that was my basis of you know how I became you know interested in art and and also in wildlife because of it and yes when I went into school I've got to admit my main subject was art um, the art teacher I had at the Secretary Modern School in Newark, he was very supportive and he really encouraged me to learn more about different artists, to see their styles of, of working and which eventually, um, when I, I left school with what was then the, um, the CSC that I came out with top marks for that, which was really good. And I hope that that would immediately then take me forward straight into art college. But things were different. Things changed. So 
so you applied to art college but then what happened uh at that after that uh while well, i applied for the art college immediately after leaving school i had been going to mansfield college of arts for um at least two years doing evening classes in life drawing and yeah. in still life and i've sort of become one of the one of the other students they sort of all took me took me under hand and if they had any weekend visits anywhere I was always invited and it was absolutely wonderful wonderful experience and so when I applied to become a full-time student I was very disappointed when I was refused I actually saw the principal at the time I'd made the appointment he'd invited me to go and see him however um he wasn't even prepared to look at my artwork. When I walked into the room, I distinctly felt I'm not going to get in. I had a feeling that things weren't going to go the way I thought they would go. And as I said, he, um, he wasn't even interested in seeing my art. He wanted to know what qualifications I'd got, which high school I'd gone to, and which obviously I couldn't say, I couldn't say that. Mm. Um, now, well, afterwards, I realised there was, it was, I'm pretty certain it was to do with prejudice. He saw me. He saw yeah. what I looked like. And um, I think that's immediately why he went cold on me. So I left feeling very, very despondent. It must have been so crushing to have had that, that love of drawing and still from your certain young age but then be encouraged by your teachers at school and then joining the evening classes at Mansfield College and then to get this one person you know to to then put this huge brick wall up in front of you it, it must you know it must have just been such a terrible um a terrible shock yes it was I, it, I, I was very unhappy about it so but I had to move forward and um at the time, my grandmother was working for John Jardine at Nottingham, and she got me a job at uh, Jessup's in Nottingham in the office, which was good to have a job. It had something to, you know, take my mind off other things. And but I stayed there until I saw an advertisement in the local New York paper uh, asking for a junior window dresser at quite a large store in New York. Nothing like most of the stores we have today. It was it was really was a very upmarket place with all sorts of departments within it. Mm, yeah, I went for I went for my interview, uh, and I got the job as window dresser, and I worked underneath a, a wonderful person, um, who sort of taught me all the different things they did. They, they actually created sculptural pieces. And it was very inventive. The windows were really, um, it was exceptional. And I was so pleased to be part of that. Um, it was a family business. And the two brothers that run the shop decided that they'd be winding up. They were both getting on in age. And so unfortunately, my career there ended, which was quite, quite upsetting, however. I then went on to get a job in um, Boots at Nottingham. Yeah. Which I stayed at for several months until um, my father invited me over to New York. Now, my father's heritage, he was actually um, his mother, who was my grandmother on his side, was Costa Rican, and his father was Jamaican. Yeah. Um, however, sort of after the war, he actually went to New York to live into Brooklyn and I was invited over and it was actually the first time I met my father. So you can imagine how, wow. you know, that was really an experience. Mm. And so I spent two, a couple of months in New York, but I still had the village mentality. I loved the wildlife. I loved landscape I loved all those sort of things New York was a little bit intimidating to me I liked certain aspects I liked the experience of being there 
However, I still felt more comfortable within natural surroundings. Yeah. I returned back to Newark and then I had a job at a factory called Ransom and Mars at the time, again in the offices. I was doing a lot of, I was still continuing doing my artwork and I was doing writing poetry and different things and having my own creative space, which was very important for me to keep. Yeah. Unfortunately, an episode happened at the office where I was working, where I wasn't quite sure what to do with this particular thing. So I asked my line manager, how do I deal with this? This is something I hadn't come across before. So he explained and he told me. However, very soon after that, I'd, I'd, I had taken his advice and done a certain thing, but I had a visit then from somebody from the factory floor saying, who's done this? <laughs> and I said, well, I did. Um, Mr. I won't say his name, so-and-so told me to do it like this. Well, Mr. So-and-so said, oh, I didn't. I didn't say anything like that. And I was absolutely furious. So I went stomping down the steps into where we had a public phone within the factory. And I phoned up Mansfield College of Arts. And I said, I'd really like to come and visit and I'd like you to see my work. This was a different principle, of course, years had yeah. passed. And he said, yeah, come along. I'd like to see you. I went and I was immediately accepted. Wow, that's, that's such an amazing story. And there's, so, there's a few parallels with, with my own journey as well. When I was at school, it was woodwork and metalwork that really got my interest, you know, and I just loved mm. making things with my hands. And it was just this one teacher that just, um, I, I was refused to be able to do GCSE woodwork and metalwork because I was a girl and he felt that I was, I would need special attention that wouldn't be fair mm. on the boys. And that, that dissuaded me from following that path. And it was like yourself, 10 years later that I went back to the local art school um, you know, and it's interesting to hear your journey, uh, you know, that you also, you know, had those barriers, but that love of, of creating was still there, still bubbling under the surface all the time. And it takes that, that one moment to suddenly for you to go, actually, this isn't really what I wanted to do and making that difficult change and that going to art college. Well, before we hear the rest of your story, Nadia, uh, we're going to take a short break and I'm going to introduce a young singer-songwriter who's um, a student at Confetti College here in Nottingham, Alfie Wallace, performing Without You.
it's the time to sort my life out Oh yeah, it's raining outside, get your jacket on quick, we need to go now Whoa. What a fantastic piece of music, Alfie. And he really does reflect that we're getting nowhere without you and that we all need a little help and support from our family and friends from time to time. So thank you, Alfie, for that fantastic song. So Nadia, back to your story. So so what happened once you uh, went back to college? You know, what was the, the next bit of the journey? Oh, it was wonderful being there. I mean, I loved the whole environment and I felt so at home. However, if I wanted to continue further with an art career, I needed to have GCEs, oh. uh, both O and A levels. So that was the next step in the journey. Going, sort of, going back to sort of the school times and actually doing studying doing to GCEs, etc. Uh, eventually, I, I got what I needed, O and A levels, and I applied to Maidstone College of Art to do the degree course. I went for my interview. I was accepted, but I was expecting to go into the painting department. However, I was invited to go into the sculpture department. And that in itself was quite a wonderful journey. The first year was absolutely brilliant. It really suited me fine because it was, um, was actually working from, um, from the model who came in, the knife drawing model, and we built full size clay figures of her, you know, to do the actual sculptures of, of the pose she was holding. Yeah. And it was the first time I'd actually worked that kind of a scale. Um, but I really, I really loved it. I did lots of drawings, lots of life drawings there. And I created this, um, the figure of the model in clay, full size. We was then going to go on, it was explained we would go on then to cast with cement or cement fondue to get a whole cast. Yeah. Unfortunately, even with help and assistance from the tutors at the time, it was too brittle. It hadn't had enough uh, scrim, enough supporting in it to suspend it without it fracturing, and it fractured everywhere. It was a mess. Oh, no. <laughs> but, but it was something which was, it was an experiment on my part, as well as onto the, the tutor that was actually um, working with this for this project and I think it's a learning curve, curve for both of us uh, but that was okay it was a learning curve and I accepted that anyway I continued it was a three-year course for um, a Bachelor of Arts degree and um, at the end of the three years I got it I'd like to have got a first mm. I got an upper second yeah which it was good, it was fine. Um, I then had the opportunity 
to apply to the Royal College of Art. Um, I thought, wow, this is amazing, because I actually got on the shortlist and I thought, that, that is something, you know, that's where I'm going next. Yeah. <laughs> and um, I went along for my interview. It seemed to go pretty good. I was quite, you know, I was quite pleased. I didn't sort of freeze up or anything. And, but unfortunately there was a twist to that tale. Um, through other means, I can't mention names, of course, I found out that um, I almost got a place, but another person, another artist I got the place was a part, you know, instead of me, um, because they felt they the college felt they'd had enough foreign students. Oh. I was going by my name Ming M I N G, and without really realizing, they didn't even ask me about my date where I was born, etc. I never thought to to add that. Anyway, I just missed the slot. Oh. I just missed it, um, and very sadly, I heard that the person that had got the place after three months had had enough of it and left. Oh dear. But, oh. Uh, but I have to accept these things, you know, these things happen in life for mm. one reason or another. And I left college um, then and sort of set off on my own career the best way I could. I did have a studio in Bermondsey, um, which I'd actually taken part um, there whilst I was at the college which was wonderful. This was a time in Bermondsey and Butler's Wharf specifically was a artist's heaven. And by artists, I mean, they had painters, sculptors, actors, photographers, uh, dancers, filmmakers. It was a whole, a whole conglomerate yes. of different artistic people. And it was a quite a wonderful place to be. What period of time was that when you had your studio? Um, that would have been, I've got sync back now. Uh, I'm thinking, seven, it, it was from, I, I went to Mainston in 75, so I would have got the studio latter of 76. Yeah. Um, and I left Mainston in 78. So I had it for, you know, a while until, unfortunately, the developers had their eye on those warehouses. Mm. And that's when that dream started to fall apart. Um, it became quite, quite a serious situation. Uh, one day whilst I was working there, um, two, two men came in, into our area where we was working in this particular warehouse they were approached and said excuse me are you looking for somebody uh, they said no we're just having a look around well my friend who was there at the time said well I'm sorry but this is private you know you don't just come in yeah the response was don't be surprised if this place doesn't go up in flames one night now that was a threat and it was a yeah. great word because a lot of people used to stay overnight in their studios, particularly, well, even like myself, rather than keep traveling back to Maidstone, it's so nice to actually go to sleep there and wake up and actually be with your work immediately. It yeah. was good. Um, and then fires did start. And to cut a very long story short, um, it was a case of we all had to leave. We all had to leave. I had nowhere else to go in London and I headed back to Newark. Yeah, gosh, that's that's crazy to think, you know, that that threatening behaviour and, um, you know, they just, you know, to move people on from spaces for development, you know, it's it's terrible. And to think of that community that you'd set up with all those different art forms, it just must have been so amazing to have all of those different disciplines all working and living together in this one space and but then to have that taken away in such an abrupt form you know is is uh, it's really terrible 
have you ever been been back since um you know since it's been developed to have a look where your studio once was well actually I have it would be about four years ago uh, because we had a friend who was in London at the time and we arranged to meet him and I said I must go to Butler's Wall must go and visit Butler's Wall he said you won't know it I said I still want to go yeah um I've got to lay the ghost and so we went and yeah multi-million pound apartments it was so different it was it was a whole it was a whole different environment I mean when I was there uh, that area was often used in films um because of it being the age it was and the big warehouses and gantries going across it had this superior sort of um it fitted so well into many of the films which was made. Yeah. Um, but no, going back, it was it was unrecognizable, really. Gosh. Can I ask what what then once you arrived back in Nottingham, did you continue with your art? Yes. Um, we came back here um, up to New York. I say because of the situation with the London studio. Um, Plus, my cousin that owned the, the flat where we was living in Maidstone wanted to put it on the market, so we headed back to New York. My mum said, well, come up here, and then you can sort of rethink the whole situation. Yeah. And we was due actually to go out to visit my husband's family in Bermuda. So off we went there, had a total break. It was good. And when we returned we found out there was um, possible studio spaces in a warehouse overlooking the river in Newark. Um, so we went to have a look and yes, we saw great potential there. And we actually took um, the space, which is right at the top of the building, mm. wonderful views. And um, we were actually told the cheap, it would be much cheaper to go on the upper floors than lower ones. That was a fib. <laughs> oh. <laughs> but no, that, that was fine. We, we, we dealt with that. And um, other people moved in, weavers, um, pottery makers, other painters. It became like a mini um, setup of what I'd been in in London. Yeah. However, it became too expensive for everybody because we was charged business rates, business electricity, business water, and um, and, it, and it really became very unviable. We couldn't have a space for an exhibition. We was offered a, sig um, a ticket office box because it was actually part of the of a museum to do with the folk life of Newark and surrounding areas, but it became unviable yeah. and so we decided everybody else had left they'd all deserted they'd had enough I think with one thing and another and um, but my mother found a, a place just on the outskirts of New York which she said you ought to go and ask about it and we did and we got it that's where we are now and there's space to have studios um and a lovely garden where we can actually grow all sorts of stuff um so uh, it's it's amazing how sometimes these journeys take us full circle isn't it you know that um uh, you know you you grew up in Newark and that that beginning that love of nature and art coming together um you know and then supported by by your family that travel into education the, the brick walls of of prejudice through uh due to race from from that uh art college teacher but then that coming back to it again and succeeding and then coming all the way back then to Newark to your roots and surrounding yourself with nature and art it's just it's been a you know an amazing journey to to listen to so thank you Nadia for sharing that with me Thank you. Well, um, if any of you are interested in 
seeing any of uh, Nadia's work, we'll put some links on uh, the social media pages. But I've also asked Nadia if she'd like to share some of her work within our exhibition in September, which is coming up at the Nottingham Society of Artists Gallery, which will be uh, a celebratory end to the first part of this project. So do tune in for the, for the next part of the podcast. And once again, thank you, Nadia, for being such a wonderful guest. Thank you, Rachel. Thank you. Over the coming months, the project will be developing and there's lots of ways that you can get in touch and find out more. Just head to my website and click on the project page, Standing in This Place.